performance anxiety. This show is different from anything I've done before. I've reached out to several former guests of the podcast and asked if they'd be willing to talk for just a few minutes about how COVID-19 has affected their professions. I'm joined by people from a wide variety of creative careers. There's guitarist Buck Curran, who lives in the European epicenter of the virus, Bergamo, Italy. I'm also joined by Mickey Bereni and Moose McKillop of Lush, Moose, and Poroshka. Chef Selena Teo of Top Chef, Iron Chef America, and her restaurant, The Belfry, joins me. Gabby Alter, who writes musical theater. There's Alan Epley of The Life and Times and The Blue Man Group. Leon McKenzie of Sure Sports. Writer and guitarist for the Lilacs, Ken Kirsten, and road veteran, singer, songwriter, guitarist, Morgan Gear, all join in. I'd like to thank them all for giving me more of their time and their candor, and we start off with Buck Curran from Bergamo, Italy. So you're currently living and in lockdown in Italy, in, in and I, I know if I pronounce this wrong every time I say it, in Bergamo? Bergamo? Uh, Bergamo. Bergamo. Yep. All right. I'm Irish, so I don't, I'm it, it, Italian's not my forte. Uh, <laughs> Me so, too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, you've been in lockdown for a while. What's the atmosphere like there for you? What's what's day to day life like right now? Well, just you know, pretty much being stuck in the in the apartment. Uh, occasionally, like well, Adele and I uh, will take turns going to the grocery store. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. We're, we're here every day doing, uh, Adele's doing some teaching, um, uh, online classes. Okay. You know? Uh, not a lot, but they, they opened that up a little bit and, uh, and, uh, nothing. We just, uh, I've, I've actually been keeping busy cause, uh, I've had this album, you know, trying to wrap it up and stuff. So, there's always a million things to do with when you're launching an album and finishing yeah. details and stuff like that. And, well, and when and, you were speaking earlier, you mentioned that you need some kind of certificate to go outside to go to the grocery store uh, to check yeah. the paperwork. Yeah, and and that's uh, yeah, you have to have that because people are getting fined. Wow. Uh, I guess a family tried to go into the woods in Bergamo. Okay. Nearby, or you know, like I don't know, definitely somebody <laughs> from Bergamo, and they they got caught. Uh oh. And not not the kids. I guess they were with their kids, but each adult got fined four hundred. Wow. So, yeah. So it's pretty serious here. Oh my. You don't want to. You don't want to mess around, and that they obviously know if you're. Uh, you're just walking around or if you're going to a grocery store, it's pretty obvious, you know. <laughs> so, so here in the U.S., we've had uh, an insane run on toilet paper. I don't know what the fascination is with everybody here in the <laughs> toilet, but you can't you can't get toilet paper. I mean, can you guys – are you able to get the necessities that you guys need? Uh, you know? Yeah, we, we haven't had a problem with toilet paper. No? <laughs> you know, it's like everything kind of like – like I was saying, like – uh, before for, there was a day or two of panic, but then after that, everybody just like adjusted very quickly. Yeah. You know, um, a little more sensible. Uh, it's, it's been nice in that regard, you know, like people are really trying to do the best that they can do and, and maintain, you know, distancing and, and following the rules and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, my God, if, if people hadn't done that, it's already was bad enough. Like they, they say one of the main things that caused, uh, well, of course we have a, a huge older population here. Yeah. We have a dense area, you know, there's over a million people from Milan to Bergamo. And then you have the Alps. Okay. You have this, it's like the front range, you know, in Colorado. Oh, okay. It's yeah. Kind of like, uh, kind of more open flat area. And then, then you have the mountains, you know. Okay. Uh, you just have so many people in that in this part of Italy. So, but they said one of the the main things that could have really been like a bomb that it, that spread this was we had the the main soccer match for uh from uh, Valencia from Spain mm -hmm. came to Milan 
to play Atalanta, the Bergamo team. Okay. So 40,000 people came from Bergamo to Milan, which is only 50 minutes away. Okay. And uh, they say that was that was a, a big way that that it probably spread so quickly. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, I mean, that's a lot of people that yeah. we had. Yeah. And I guess I saw, like, subsequent news that the – a third or maybe more of the Valencia team all contracted it. And oh, my gosh. So it's just a big, you know, cesspool uh, of COVID, you know. Yeah. So are, are you so, hearing any anything about what might, what life might got, be like? You know, only, yeah, yeah, good. We, we only got, um, I don't know, I... I'm really trying not to think too much. When I start to think about it, I start to feel a little nuts. Uh, well, yeah. uh, but like, when is it going to end? You know, because yeah. nothing's changed for us. Like people were really interested in talking to me. For, for instance, people were when this first happened because Bergamo is the epicenter. Yeah. Well, since the beginning of March, Literally nothing has changed except for every couple of days, 600 more people die. God. You know, it's crazy. It's like, uh, that, it, and the weather's changed. It's it's full spring now. It's beautiful outside. Yeah. You know, it's it's like, so you suffer for that as well, yeah. right? Well, you, and I, anyways, your your body needs sunshine and fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. So and that's... I saw that you, you and Adele did do a really sweet video of um, oh, deep in the uh, deep in the loving arms of my babe. Uh, Look, yeah, in yeah, in our apartment, like yeah. right out in the stairwell. Yes, in the empty stairwell in front of our apartment. I thought <laughs> was that was that a little bit of going going a little stir crazy or is it? That was kind of more at the beginning of the situation when we had all this. Like, oh, okay, we're going to have to be doing more online music and stuff, you know? Yeah. So we thought to record that. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, uh, for practice as much as anything else, you know? Well, it's a very sweet video. I really enjoyed watching that. That was great. Um, so, yeah, but, oh, what I, what I meant to say is we just heard that uh, Bergamo will probably – be the last that yeah uh, part of Italy that goes back to normal operation oh, because wow. we were the, we've been the worst hit you know and oh, the hospital yeah. is only 10 minutes from our apartment is uh, one of the most dangerous places in the world you know with the uh, and yeah. uh, so and you guys have yeah, we, young our kids doctors and... there for our you know, Adele is due in August, wow. our child. Yeah. And we can't go see our doctor at the hospital. She just uh, finally managed like a private uh, visit today. But it had been, we, we, she's uh, at the, ha pretty much like at the halfway mark now. And, yeah. you know, for the whole time until today, we haven't known what's been going on. If we even kind of, uh, wow. You know, like, is the baby is still alive? We don't. Yeah, is everything okay? And so hopefully, hopefully there's. So there's yeah, good news yeah, there. everything's everything's going okay as far as we know. Although she's got another appointment, I think in five days to, and we'll understand what what the sex is going to be. Oh, good. it's going to be a boy and girl. Good. So, uh, so you guys going to yeah. find out then? Yeah, yeah, we're we're totally uh, fine. I'll tell oh, you a funny well, story about there's that. There's a there's a song on the on the new album called Lucia, which is dedicated to the baby. Oh, so. that's beautiful. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll tell you a funny story about that. That that you can think about while you, while you're learning the the gender of your baby. My wife and I, when we had our first, decided we wanted it to be a surprise. So like, yeah. Oh, yeah, why not? So. You know, she had her appointments and, and all, and then uh, we decided, oh, we'll paint the baby's room yellow and, and have it just kind of so it could it, it could work either way. Either way. Yeah. So my wife goes to to get the sonogram done, the ultrasound, I don't know, ultrasound, whatever, whichever one it is. Oh. 
And yeah. uh, th- the nurse said, she's going, she's like, okay, everything's looking good. And she's like, all right, do you guys want to know what, what the gender is? And my wife turns to me and I'm like, well, you know, you know, what, you know what we decided? She's like, okay. She turns to the, to the nurse and she says, sure. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And it'd be before we could say, wait, no, no. She said, oh, you're having a girl. And my wife, <laughs> my wife looked at me and she goes, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I says, oh, well, you know, now, well, now, now we can prepare. So, and then after that, we just decided we had two more. And we we're like, yeah, just go ahead and tell us. Why not? What the hell? <laughs> so. Yeah. And Lucia's a, a girl name, you know? Yeah. Well, so a girl's name, and but of course we can change it to Lucho, but the song's going to be yeah. Lucia. Yeah. <laughs> so, the official, but I mean that you know that's uh, it means light. Oh, Latin, okay. Yeah. Latin base for light, so it seemed very positive. Uh, <laughs> well, you no know, name. That's beautiful for especially, <laughs> especially now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Next up are Mickey Berenyi and Ruth McKillop. They discuss the projects that they were working on and what's going on since the virus locked everything down. Yeah, I don't want to take up all of your day, so. That's fine. We got, we got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> really busy. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so um, I guess the first thing I wanted to know is you guys are in the same band in addition to your, your your other bands, but you guys are in Poroshka, and you just don't exactly rely on touring per se for an income, but you do have a lot of other projects that you're working on. Um, I don't know, Moose, you had several things going that, that have been postponed. How, what's going on with the, with the projects for Moose and, and Poroshka right now? Well, um, in terms of Moose, um, up to Christmas we were talking about getting a box set together of all of everything that we ever did, wow. <clears throat> you know, even, even peel sessions, B sides, whatever we could do. Um, that was a suggestion. Um, I think it's been kicked into the long grass by this. Um, and it was, it was never really, it hadn't really solidified into anything that where there was any kind of timeline on it. It was more kind of, this could happen if we want it to okay. Simon, Simon from Belly Union was more than happy to do a lot of the legwork and and get it all up and running. Um, but it would be very much a labour of love for him. Um, Russell, the singer, he lives in um, he lives in Portugal now, and um, we have regular email contact and a bit of back and forth. But I I think he he's kind of more keen on maybe doing some kind of compilation. Um, mm. I think Simon feels that if we're going to do it, we might as well do it properly and uh and and do a, a, a you know a, a, something that's for completists yeah i agree with Simon. I, 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 so I, do I. I, yeah i think that would be that would be quite nice um but i think um it's it's very much for next year now definitely for next year because um in a strange way the the, the timing of this the the, the covid 19 catastrophe i mean it is it's 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 an absolute catastrophe for for you know never mind music or entertainment or sport i mean just you know things that really don't aren't really that important it just for everyday life um and the loss of life is is shocking but um i think that you know we we just just about finished recording our album just i mean literally days before lockdown this is piroshka this is piroshka okay so the album the album's done, um, and the uh, it's going to be mixed um, over the next few weeks or months, and that can be done remotely. Um, the guy that the guy that recorded it, Iggy, he um, he's going to start mixing it. We need to have a few conversations with him, but it, that's going to be happening in the next few months. And in a weird way, it doesn't really interfere with our schedule too much because recording was ninety nine percent finished. Okay, it's not coming out till next year anyway. Um, and I think, um, our, we, we had no touring plans whatsoever. I mean, we, I think that was a bit weird, wasn't it? Because part of the reason we had no touring plans is because Justin, I mean, we don't really make, our, none of us make our living out of Karoshka, thank God, otherwise we'd be <laughs> on the streets, right? Yeah. So, 
basically everyone else has got a job. You know, I work from home anyway. Uh, Moose's job has been affected, kind of. Uh, but, you know, Justin and Mick both kind of make their money from Justin does it touring with other bands, you know, doing like crew, drum tech kind of stuff. And, right. you know, Mick tours with Modern English. Um, and both of those, they had like a whole l- bunch of stuff booked for this year and it's all cancelled. Oh, so, gosh. you know, they were more it was more frightening for them, I think, you know, especially for Justin, because he had the whole year booked, you know, touring with the pretender. Oh God. So it, that's, uh, you know, and, and it's constantly being updated. It's now like, Oh, well, we're looking at maybe they might go away in October. Oh, that might get pushed further. And, Wow. It's impossible to plan anything, isn't it? Really? Yeah. And even even here in the States, you know, they're they're actually talking about you know, starting to open up a little bit to smaller things in the June and July, actually. Um, but you know, sports is enormous here. Like like you know, American football is, is enormous here. The NBA canceled their season basically uh, and now they're actually talking about cutting players' salaries at this point. Um, a hockey season's done. Baseball season is delayed. And so, uh, in fact, I'll be having somebody on, on who deals with athletes and, and their income uh, on this show, and he's going to give us a little more insight on, on how how athletes are going to be dealing with this because their income is getting paid. Everybody thinks they've got millions, but you know they may not have access to it immediately. And so... You know, yeah, yeah. So you know, a lot of people are being affected by it in ways you don't even think. Uh, but you guys are still able to do some, you know, because Mickey, you work from home, and and, and Moose, you're still able to get some creative things going, and like the mixing of the new Peroshka album. Um, you guys ever consider, since you're at home, doing a, a project together, just the two of you? Um, I think Peroshka is our project together, really. <laughs> okay. You know, you know. I, I think that, um, especially the, the the new the new LP, where you know we've taken on the bulk of the the, the songwriting really between us. Okay. Moose is already on to doing something of his own. He's like already <laughs> like running off to the other room with the computer. I'm going. Where are you going? So I'm just going to work on some stuff. That's all. <laughs> like, Okay, I see. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've never done anything. I've never done a solo thing before. And I thought, you know, I, I know that we're going to be in lockdown for, at least for the next few months. Yeah. Um, and possibly longer because, you know, they're, they're, you know, they are taking it very seriously here. And rightly so. Rightly yeah, yeah. So. And, I, and I'd, I'd hate to come out of this in the autumn and, and think that I wasted months and months when I could have been sitting with a keyboard and a drum machine and a, a laptop and well doing stuff. So I, I've been doing stuff, um, okay. but just, just me on my own. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that, and, and this, this came this, and I've heard you, I'm sure you guys have heard this a million times, but, and, and a lot of acts I've seen are doing live streams to uh, help, you know, bring some money in since they can't tour. Mm. If you guys did that, just the two of you in a, in a like an acoustic Peroshka thing, you could call it Mickey Moose. Mm-hmm. Then you get sued by Disney. That brings even more attention to you guys. Yeah. And then you get yeah. legal help and all the money just starts to pour right in. Pour in. <laughs> I mean, in a weird way, there's absolutely nothing stopping us, um, you know, with like putting a microphone like you've got um, – um, we've got one right next to us here. Yeah. Um, we've got all the instrumentation we need, amplification. We've got a son who can drum. Uh, we've got a daughter who can play piano. There's absolutely no reason why we can't be the Partridge family for an afternoon, <laughs> except that, except that we, we don't want we don't we don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, that that's you know half the battle of actually wanting to do that. Has, yeah. Has this whole pandemic made you look at things differently um and when when you can go back to playing live and working on on projects together as a band are you going to do anything differently i mean i think to be honest that conversation was had you know prior to all of this anyway because i think you know for us i think it was quite a you know there was such a long gap for me between lush 
and then the Lush reunion. And obviously that was a, a, you know, a bigger band. It was a comeback. It was all kind of like, you know, big venues, blah, blah, blah. Then to start the Poroshka thing, you know, it was like, it's like starting over really. And I don't really know the music industry in the same way. And that was a bit of a learning curve. So even doing this album and taking that album out and we were like, oh, let's get you to play the keyboard and we'll get Suki on it. And you realise that with six of you, oh my God, you know, just it's but you can barely make enough money and there's so much stress about, are we going to sell enough merchandise to be able to, you know, not actually physically lose money on this. Right. That's why we didn't go to America as well. I mean, I'd love to go to America, but you're sitting there and thinking, Oh my God, we could potentially lose like 30,000 pounds, you know, especially wow. with a six piece band and sound man and blah, 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 you know, all that. Right. Yeah. So I mm. think it was just the reality of it. So we've had to kind of look at how we would do that anyway. I mean, you know, most, I think the one thing that that's calcified for you in this sort of co- post-coronavirus age is the idea of just not wanting to get on a plane ever again. No, never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We we had a no we had a we had a, an, a band meeting back in January actually, and I, I told Mick and Justin that um, I decided that I didn't want to fly anymore, um, and. Uh, I was going the full 100% Greta Thunberg, uh, <laughs> and and the, 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 which would rule out going to America. Uh, yeah. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to spoil it for. I didn't want to say, well, that means Poroshka can't play in America because. It, so we've been looking at alternatives, um, or well, not, actually talk, just talking about alternatives. Really finding somebody else to play guitar. Um, but again, you know, it, it costs so much money to go to America, and. Yeah. Um, you know, but if it happens, you know, that we would get someone else to do the live stuff. And, you know, mm. there's always a way around this stuff anyway. So we were yeah. looking at that kind of stuff anyway. But I don't think, you know, because we're not a kind of, you know, we've all got separate jobs. So when we were never going to be launching into some sort of, you know, 20 week world tour anyway. Right. So mm. this sort of the whole kind of. Uh, and, and also because our album wasn't going to be out till next year anyway. So it's not like we're even thinking of, oh, we're going to push dates to next year or we're going to work on a new album. I mean, it's kind of how it was going to be anyway. So it's it's really about, I mean, the biggest problem would probably be that, you know, if the album comes out next year, we, we probably wouldn't get a chance to play any festivals because I get the feeling that everybody who was on this year's bill will get honoured to play on next year's bill. Yeah. And, you know, we'll be out on the car park going, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right at the back of the line, like, yeah. <laughs> selling selling bootleg t-shirts. Yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> See, you can do what 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 people do here. It, they go across the street and and play in the park instead. Yeah. Okay, so that wasn't that unrealistic. No, <laughs> <it> wasn't, no. <laughs> but yeah, from what we can gather, most you know most of the uh, the ba- people that we know in bands have uh, have basically put a, a kind of a 12 month furlough on, on this for, the, for themselves. They know that they were promised this festival or that festival this year. Yeah. And I think the festival lineups won't change that much from, you know, what was being advertised um, for this year. You'll, you'll see the same, same lineups next year. Um, same artwork, just changed 19 to 20. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Someone did say it was a good, there's always a big argument when people do merchandise is do you put the tour dates on the back of the t-shirt? And I like people are really divided about that. Some people are like, absolutely. And others like me and Moose. Are absolutely a bit more, not. More <laughs> arty bands are always like, Oh no, we don't yeah. like that. That's for metal bands. And we feel yeah. like- <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's for Bon Jovi. And- yeah. <laughs> Poison yeah. and bands like that. that. Those are the ones that you have their tour dates on. The, but in my mind, I could be wrong. But, yeah. but see, we're now proven right. Yeah. All, all that merchandise is now going to have to go get shredded and redone. <laughs> it's it's going to be what, what they do with, the, uh, with all the big sporting events here. So what they do is they print shirts... For, where both teams are the champions, like for the Super Bowl, right. it's like let's say you know, let's say it's like you know the the Patriots and the Falcons again. They print both teams as the winners, and then whichever one loses, those get shipped to third world countries and get <laughs> sent to the to people in the third world countries. <laughs> so that's what's going to happen with all that merch now. 
So there's probably people growing up in West Africa with a really skewed history of American sport. Oh, exactly. The <laughs> Atlanta Falcons, world champions. You know, that never happened. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you keep an eye out on National Geographic, and when you see some of one of those shirts, know that the other team won. <laughs> so if you see anybody with a world championship shirt in 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 South Africa, then right, you yeah, know yeah. they they actually lost. So. <laughs> well, that's uh, the last thing I want to know is how is day to day life for you guys? I mean, here in, what we've had some insane shit go down, oh, but not like you'd think. I don't know. I don't know what it's like in in the UK, but over here, as soon as they started saying you guys have to, you know, self quarantine and go on lockdown, the one thing that like flew off the shelves was toilet paper. And mm. for like the last month, I still can't get toilet paper. We had we had something very similar. The, the, thing, the things that, that flew off the shelves were toilet paper. Um, any okay. uh, pasta, uh, bread, and flour, flour and yeast for making yeah. bread, um, and cakes, that kind of stuff was really hard to get hold of for about two and a half weeks. Some of it still is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't get flour. It's like gold dust. Really? <laughs> it, it, yeah. That's a toilet paper is a currency here. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it is insane. It's become prison cigarettes or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except what I noticed well, I mean, obviously we live in London, so, you know, the, all the toilet paper would be gone from, like, the big supermarkets. Yeah. But if you just went to your local shop, you know, like some Turkish deli or, or the kind of Indian shop, you know what I mean? Loads of toilet paper, okay? Really? Oh, you're giving away a secret now. Well, yeah. it's, it's the bulk <laughs> buyers. It's the sort of supermarket panic of the trolley and... Oh my god! I'm gonna have. I'm gonna buy like eighty rolls or oh. something. That's what. Yeah. Did you see the the story about the jackass who bought like seventeen thousand bottles of hand sanitizer and then they wouldn't let him resell it? So yeah. He stuck with them. <laughs> he was trying to sell them for like twenty bucks a bottle, and they're like, nope. Uh, so now he's stuck with them. He's banned from Amazon. So he's now he's got a garage full. Of little tiny bottles of hand sanitizer. And all I can say to that is ha, ha, ha. Exactly. Serves you right. Leon McKenzie of Sure Sports is up next. He does a lot of work with athletes and therefore has a very unique perspective. I wanted to ask you a couple things. I mean, we're right in the middle of NFL draft season. And uh, there's been some really interesting news coming down the pike with the NBA and Major League Baseball and all. And kind of wanted to see how quarantining and stay in place orders are are affecting ball players. Well, I guess uh, a day after the first round of the draft, it was kind of interesting to see what really had evolved well ahead of coronavirus. But guys kind of doing their hometown party now. Yeah. This time, I don't know if you noticed. It wasn't, you know, a thousand of uh, Mike Smith or whoever's closest <laughs> friends. I right. think everybody's very careful after the Dak Prescott uh, little showing there. They're potentially having a gathering of more than 10. Yep. I don't think you ever counted more than nine people on anybody's <laughs> screen there. So uh, <laughs> nobody went to network. Uh, so, but, you know, I think a lot of it, what I thought was cool was Rosenhaus was with his guys. Malky was with his guys. So he even still came. Uh, and, Throwing no shade, but not everybody had, were full CDC outfits. So right. it was kind of like uh, they were admitted in. But I think it was – I think the NFL did a great job and was able to make a nice production and raise a lot of money out of it yeah. by kind of going in a slightly unexpected direction and, and still kind of making it work for them. Yeah, exactly. And, and I was really curious to watch the production value of it since it was all going to be virtual. So I was I was pleasantly surprised with how well it, they – it went. I saw I saw one guy's boom camera fall or boom uh, mic fall after <laughs> he was drafted. So I, I don't know, and I'm sure I'm sure somebody knows, and it might be something for you to look into. Kind of if the NFL kind of helped everybody get get situated in a very similar fashion, or yeah. if guys and their agents took it upon themselves. So I wasn't really sure how they worked that out, but it was cool. Yeah, it was neat to see uh, you. They would show the the wide shot, and you'd see a guy with like a, the Bengals background, but you would see how it was set up. So that was being a former photographer. I always loved seeing that kind of sure. stuff. So. Yeah, no, I thought it was really neat. Also, I saw a couple 
what looked like maybe moms or uh, there was a couple guys too, so it wasn't all female, but kind of weaving some people out of the picture who maybe were filming stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. so that was a little. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, the, we, you you caught all that? So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so be, before we get too deep into this, um, explain exactly what Sure Sports does. Sure. Sure Sports uh, provides all sorts of credit facilities to uh, professional athletes. We do this. Basically, we can do any, everything from car loans to mortgages, but our competitive advantage is really doing contract-based lending where we can lend user the athlete's contract as an asset on their balance sheet and lend to professional athletes for various business opportunities and all sorts of different things that conventional banks maybe could do, but professional athletes, although they have great income, they're a little bit younger, don't have maybe the credit history, some of the other things, and that may be some of the conventional banks really, really warrant before the 25-year-old goes and does his first construction project. Yeah. Uh, that may be a little bit more challenging at Wells Fargo or a lot more challenging at Wells Fargo than at First Sports. So we've kind of become the, 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 the bank for professional athletes. So you're talking with athletes as they're ha- before they're getting their contract and as they're hammering their contracts out and, and after their contracts are signed. Sure. Ninety percent of our clients are already already under contract, uh, probably a little bit higher than that. Pre-draft represents roughly one percent of our business. We did have two first rounders last night. Nice. And we should have. Yeah, that's always fun to see those guys go. Yeah. And, uh, and we will have should have three or four more uh, drafted tonight. And we do already have three definite NBA lottery picks. So. Oh, nice. So, so that. That segues perfectly into what I wanted to ask you next. Um, how does the fact that the uh, the NBA season was curtailed, the NFL season is, is is uncertain at this point when it's going to start? How does that affect what a player who's being drafted can can do with their contract as far as as the credit? You know, getting some money ahead of time. Sure, really, it doesn't impact as much particularly for us, it doesn't impact as much what we can do from a credit facility standpoint to the, to the athletes because the athletes, particularly in basketball and football, are essentially getting four-year deals in most cases. So okay. um, I, I know there's, a, there's some deviation in that, but just to kind of give you an idea for us to be able to look at year two or maybe year three and still be able to create a credit facility, it hasn't been a huge hindrance. I think where it's probably been a hindrance is that some of the other, uh, the JP Morgans of the world, some of the other competitors that try to dabble in our space are probably having a, a, a hell of a time trying to figure out what to do with, uh, you know, how, how to reassess the athlete on the fly and to have essentially try to move the Titanic <laughs> that those institutions are yeah. to be able to adapt to such a current thing. So okay. uh, to that extent, um, may, maybe we're, we're leaner and meaner and be able to take a, a, a greater advantage of this. So you you're more of a you can you can take it I don't want to say take advantage you you can react quicker than than a large institution exponentially so I, so and that's that's not a shot at the large institution it's just the nature of the beast so, exactly so the athletes still have the wants and needs we just funded or as a matter of fact we have a closing in about 15 minutes for uh, Shore Lottery pick funding his uh lost his insurance policy his disability policy because he wants to get back out and work out kind of a little bit more full fledged as certain places are easing certain restrictions. And so that's something that he's put off for the last, we've had to request for almost two months and we're going to do that today for him because he wants to find that coverage and get back out on the court. I think early March, uh, that was, that was, that was put on hold by probably all the the people around him. So that's that's going to be fun today. Have you been, have you heard any buzz about uh, concerning the NBA that they're going to be cutting players' salaries due to the curtailed season? Is that affecting them at all or affecting your business? It is going to impact us because we're going to have to restructure some of our existing notes to our players. So that's what about 50% of our workload has been restructuring some of the work, some of the existing notes that we had for professional baseball players who missed their 415 checks and for. Uh, professional hockey players who also didn't get their full 415 checks. And so, so we being able to defer those, uh, defer those repayments, so to speak, and be able to kind of uh, push these things back to 
three months, six months, just like any other bank would do to try to work with our clients has been a big part of our business. And likely with the MBA saying that there was going to be a 25% reduction in the May 15 checks, we'll see something very similar there. Uh, it's definitely on our horizon, for sure. Okay, because, you know, a lot of people are, th- are thinking that, hey, these guys are millionaires. They want to just live off of what they have. So, Look, nobody's going to cry for these guys, <laughs> per se, but... You know, not everybody is LeBron James. The median exactly. median income is two point five million, and there's a there's a handful. There's a, there's about, and I think um, I spoke on this recently. About thirty three percent of athletes, kind of in that, still accumulating some wealth and making around about that million dollar range. Again, nobody's going to cry for them, but if you cut off. If you cut off that faucet and you're in year one, it's a lot different than year 15 of $40 million. And particularly when you're the 22 year old breadwinner and a lot of different things that where there's a lot of mouths depending on you. And, and quite frankly, in this situation, those mouths are out of work as well. So yeah, exactly. And, and not, not all of these guys are, are, are completely liquid. You know, they're, they're a lot of their money is tied up in things. So they don't have access Absolutely. to that money. Absolutely. There are some guys who are starting to build very nice portfolios that saw, you know, may have a million dollars and maybe a small credit line and a couple percent against that million dollars. But when you watch 30, 40 percent of your uh, of your marketable or sorry, of your uh, marketable securities and your, your net worth maybe go away and, you know, and, and then they start talking about cutting your paychecks. It's not going to be long for particularly for the younger guys. And again, I'm not talking about the 10 year veteran, although there'll be a handful of them that maybe haven't prepared as well, but <laughs> yeah. I'm talking more about the, the 18, the 18, 19, 20 year old draftee who's been in the league for one or two years. Right now, so. what are the, the, the guys who are just drafted in the NFL? What should they expect if the season gets delayed? Is that, uh... I mean, your guess is as good as mine, Mark. So there's a <laughs> lot of, there's a lot of factors that go into that. I think that one of the biggest things are uh, the player, the challenge of players getting physicals so that they can receive their signing bonuses, uh, even to be a part of the virtual workout. I, I, I'm not an attorney, but I'm sure uh, guys who uh, affiliate with like the Darren Heitner might may suggest, hey, I don't know if you want to go to that virtual workout, that voluntary workout, if you don't have your contract inked. So I'm not really sure on yeah. on that part. And if you can't ink your contract till you've had a physical and not all states are the same and the NFL, I think is coming down saying, no, 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 not till every team can get guys that have their physicals. We're not going to do this on state by state, but the physicals aren't going to be allowed across the board. So, you know, I think every day there's new information on this. And I think the league's trying to answer all of the leagues are trying to answer the questions that are being asked of the players, um, you know, the players associations that they're affiliated with. Gabby Alter is up next. He writes musical theater and records under the name Yes Gabriel. He tells us how COVID-19 has affected theater. You kind of inhabit a a different world than a lot of the people I've had on this show. Um, You've released an album, an EP that you play out live in in New York and in that area. But you also write musical theater. Yes, and New York is in an insane lockdown right now. I've never, never seen anything like it. I'm, you know, I know New Yorkers have never seen anything like it. You know, yeah. Pictures of Times Square where it's completely empty. Yeah. So, are you working on new music? What are you doing to stay creative? Um, yeah, I am working on some new music. I have actually. I'm part of a writing. It's like a theater writers group um, at this downtown theater group called the Civilians and. They do research-based and interview-based, sort of interview-based pieces. So in other words, like they'll take a topic, like they did one actually on climate change, and they interviewed a lot of different people about it, and then they took the interviews and made them into a theatrical piece with songs. Yeah, so it's a very cool thing. Uh, the the late Michael Friedman, who was a really interesting, um, talented guy, co-founded them, and. So anyway, so they do these pieces and we're doing one on money and I actually have to write it. Um, we have some interviews with different people that work in finance and also that um, just different ways that, you know, because everyone has a relationship with money. So we, we kind of, you know, bring it out in the open and start uh, dialogue about it and, you know, where it's from, what, why, sort of like questioning the assumptions behind it. 
Interesting. Um, That's really wild. Yeah. So did you have anything that was up and, and running that was really affected by the theaters shutting down? Yeah. I mean, nothing up and running, but like there have been a few, like I basically had three projects in development. Um, one of them was my old show that I told you about, Nobody Loves You, right. which is, you know, it's comedy about a reality TV show. And we had just gotten um, a place at this uh, new, new works festival at ACT, which is in San Francisco. It's like a big regional theater in San Francisco. Okay. Like, you know, like when they have, usually I think it's like Broadway stuff. We'll sometimes go there. Anyway, they're, they're, you know, they're like the big theater in San Francisco and they were going to do a reading of it, like a public reading, which, um, that of course got canceled. The whole <laughs> season got canceled yeah. and then we don't know when that's going to happen again. So oh, man. yeah. Uh, and then the, this other project I am working on, we're still working on it cause it's not done yet, but it's a, a commission piece about East Germany. Um, and sort of like these people that, yeah, uh, it's about rock music because it, during the cold war behind the iron curtain rock, you know, was this very subversive kind of force. Yeah. Um, you know, you couldn't listen to certain albums. They did have their own rock music, but you know, it was very heavily censored. You couldn't write about certain topics. So the Western rock was very like important. So anyway, so we're writing the show about that. And, um, and that was going to have like a, an investor's, uh, I guess showcase. And we were going to try and get it, you know, developed. Of course that also stopped. But, but the good thing is that we could still work on it and we could still write it. Right. Yeah. And maybe, and the producers are talking about like, Oh, maybe we'll do like a televised, so, you know, some kind of filmed version of it. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it's just it's yeah. kind of changing formats then. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, cause, cause it, the, look, you know, at, you know, as much as I do in a way about like what's going to happen in the future, it's just really uncertain. And what seems clear to me because, you know, like theater is what it is, right. I think it can't really come back and particularly in New York, it can't really come back. I think until we have a vaccine, um, because people, you know, theater audiences tend to be older and also in New York, Tourists, right? Tourists make up the, the audience for Broadway. So they're not going to come back until there are vaccines and they feel safe to go into a room with 500 other people. Right. Um, right. So that's kind of putting things on hold. You know, and so I think people are going to figure out doing more stuff online, you know, streaming more stuff. But at the same time, and I think things will come back eventually, but it's going to be a long wait, I think. Right. And I've seen a lot of artists do things like you know, live streams for their music and all. And I've, I, yeah. Part of, I've taken improv classes in DC, and I so I get their newsletters, and 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 I'm on their lists and all, and I've seen them do some improv things uh, online. Uh, is there any way to do that for theater? Is there any thought, or is it that would that just be a way to rehearse? Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I don't know. I think I know people in the theater are totally doing like um, what have people done. Uh, I mean, I know, well, one thing they're doing now is they're streaming archived shows. Like there's, there's now a Broadway, um, website, but like a Broadway streaming website. And, you know, it's like, Oh, you can see, you know, you can see a show from not like now, not like a current, you can't watch Hamilton. Right. 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 <laughs> Cause then everybody would just watch it. And then, yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> but you can like, you know, you can watch an older show. Um, and I think there are probably performances like there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's this whole online community of people that are really into, uh, Broadway actors, you know, know who they are, follow them on social media. So I'm sure those people are doing, going to be doing lots of concerts, just like a rock star would or, or an indie musician. Right. Um, as far as, you know, what's tricky though, as I was thinking about this, like if we're going to do a presentation, I'll invite, I, I think I can invite you. I think it's like a public thing. Um, for the money show, we're doing some kind of presentation in June and you know, I mean, I'm like, okay, so how are we going to do it? Because you can't like, you can't have people sing at the same time. I mean, it's just, it's, I think it's impossible. You can, but like, uh, you'd have to pre-record it, I think, um, cause of lag. Yeah. Lag. And then the thing that I found when in doing these interviews is that when, one, one uh, input will overtake the other. So if you and I are talking at the same time, yeah. one, of, one of us is going to go down in the mix so bad you you 
inaudible. And so it would just be one person. So you'll see a bunch of other people, their lips yeah. open, but you won't hear anything. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, I, I'm sort of like, well, how are we going to do it? I mean, and then clearly they're, they have said they're going to do it, you know, so it might be that like the songs are pre-recorded or we just give the actors like a backing track and then they can sing to it. I, I mean, I can't think of any other solutions off the top of my head. I mean, you know, maybe uh, the quarantine will be or this whatever the shelter in place will be lifted. Um, people can be in the same room. But even, even then, I've str- like, I, I would feel very nervous being in a room with people singing because they're projecting. And if they are carriers, you know, it's just like yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a weird set of problems. It really is one note. I don't think anybody ever anticipated. Nope. <laughs> Has this given you any ideas for any future musical theater productions any 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 uh, ideas about the virus for a, a musical yeah I, to be honest no i mean it's <laughs> I, I think there's been joking like with people and other theater people where it's like okay who's gonna do quarantine the musical and it's like it's coming real soon but like i'm not doing it and <laughs> runner was like nah i'm not i'm definitely not doing that one like it's just you know it's there somebody can do like the funny version you right. know um and, uh, I mean, part of it is just, it's like, it's happening. You know what I mean? Like we're in the, we're in the disaster movie now. Yeah. It's a little hard to, you know, it's like, well, what's the, what's, I can't, I can't really, th- I'm thinking about how to survive the disaster movie. Not like, <laughs> not how you're going to write it afterwards. Yeah. And particularly as a musical, I, mean, I think there's going to be lots of things to do, but, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think well, one thing it has just made me think more about is like with the Berlin, the East Germany project, like what, you know, are there other forms that we can have this take? Because we may be able to get in a room together at some point, but, um, but again, theater might not come back like commercially for two, three years. So what can we do in the meantime? And that's probably going to involve film streaming. Um, there's another project, an older project I had where I'm like, oh, actually now might be a good time to try and pitch it as a TV show, you know, just, just cause it's like the TV and movie industries, you probably know this, but they're going full blast. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess they're like figuring like now is a time when people can sit and read scripts and look at pitches. Um, they can't film. And obviously when they can film again, there's going to be a backlog, but even so I think there's this, this huge demand now for, uh, online entertainment. And so people are kind of like, wow. All right. Like, what can we do? So that, that's one thing. I mean, just sort of as a business strategy, I'm like, well, I, I don't know if we can get this made, but this would be a good time to try and get it seen by, by TV executives. Um, and for the other things, I mean, yeah, it's very, again, it's sort of like, I know that theater is going to come back. It's going to take a really long time. So I, I feel like my projects aren't over, but I have to really be thinking in a much longer time frame than I was. Right. And And I think, I mean, the main thing is it's giving me a chance to like, A, to write new stuff, you know, and, and you can still like, we could absolutely workshop it online. Like you could get people uh, on a zoom call to do a reading and even a sing through, um, you know, with again, giving them back, back in tracks and they can sing in their own home. Um, uh, you know, and maybe there will be like an emerging audience, like the, this Broadway streaming thing, I think there's going to be audience for that, but maybe there's going to be even an emerging audience for people that are like, they love theater, but they would also like to look at some new theater and maybe, maybe even regional theaters. And I, I, I pray for them right now. I'm not really religious, but you know, I think some of them are going to go out of business. Um, and I think the hopefully, yeah, there's one theater, there was another project I'm working on and they invited us. They were like, well, you know, originally they were talking about commissioning us to do this piece and they were like, we, we can't do that now. You know, we can't promise anything now because we're basically fighting for our survival. Um, but they did invite us to this, uh, writer's retreat in October. And it's like, you know, that's a lot of assumptions. First of all, that the writer's retreat will be yeah. <laughs> something we do yeah. <laughs> that they'll be open, but you know, they're sort of assuming for now, like, okay, by October, like, you know, something will be figured out. Anyway, so we're, uh, uh, you know, so we, we're still in dialogue with them, but it is clear that they're, they may not exist, but they hope they will. Yeah. Um, so I, I just hope that, but maybe regional theaters will figure out things like sort of doing, you know, gathering audiences online that are hungry for theater and 
doing online stuff, you know, well, that could be. Here's hoping. Is, is yeah. there any, any way that uh, theater lovers can, can help support music, yes. musical theater while the, everything's closed? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think just follow your, the writers that you like. And if they do something online and ask for tips, you know, support them, um, you know, let your friends know, you know, oh, hey, there's this cool writer I like, they're doing something online, or you should listen to their, their album, or, you know, it's like, it's like, probably what's going to happen in different forms is that we'll be putting our stuff online and being like, Hey, these are our projects. Cause this is the only way to promote them now yeah. and let people know about them and just really, you know, cultivate, like, like let people know if there's something you like, it's just the same, like with indie music, um, tip, tip people. If they ask for a tip, uh, that's all I can think of right now. Cause I mean, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I don't have any show to, <laughs> to yeah. sell tips. Too, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to have one for a really long time. <laughs> oh. I think, I think, you know, like well, a, a miracle. <laughs> yeah. Jeff Selena Teo talks about how COVID-19 has affected her restaurant and the restaurant business in general. Anyway, I know you've got I, stuff to do, so I won't keep you forever. Um, but I, I wanted to know a little bit about how the whole lockdown and stuff is affecting your business because I know everywhere restaurants are shut down and they're, they're limited in what they can do. And so I wanted to find out a little bit more from somebody it's affecting directly about how you're working around everything. Well, let's see. We were locked down March 24th. Uh, was the day the for Kansas City, Missouri. Obviously, Missouri didn't follow for long af- weeks after that. Um, but in Kansas City, we were already shut down. So I have a pretty small, tight crew anyway. Uh, there's only seven people on my staff. Oh, wow. You know, some of them only worked, you know, one day. Um, so, you know, we have Doug, John, Jake, and Darius. I had just hired as a manager the end of um, January. Oh, <clears throat> Last wow. week of January, he came back. And, you know, we just found out he would, well, we found out weeks ago that he would have been laid off and, and if he was still in Dallas. And uh, another cook that joined my team uh, at the beginning of December, his, the whole restaurant um, laid off their whole crew, too. Oh, man. The exception of, like, maybe two people, if that. But I feel like the, whole, the husband and wife do everything themselves. Wow. Um, yeah. And this is, you know, this is a lot of work. So I kind of personally transitioned and kept... Uh, doing the food to go. Um, and then I transitioned my AM catering, my corporate catering, and I turned that into, and I've actually been doing these family meal kits for about a year and a half, um, but I've only done them for a couple of people. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't like a public thing. I just did it for a couple that asked me to do it. Oh, okay. And basically, <clears throat> basically I make dinner for four and all they do is pop it in the oven or they might just uh, like heat a sauce and sear scallops or whatever. Right. It's very minimal. There's no chopping. There's no, there's no nothing. You, oh, wow. I, you, most of the time you just toss the salad with the dressing and you put two containers in the oven and then you eat. Um, so, okay. you know, the first week I did like eight of them and now, you know, I'm now I'm doing pre-orders for the following week and I've got like 45 of them. Wow. Now. So I don't know. Did I show you the pic, the picture? You should, it's see. funny. I'll tell you, let me see. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was on my email. Where is this? Oh, here. Oh yeah, I did see that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think that was on your Instagram. That was, yeah, that was great. Yep. So 35 meal kits is about all I can fit in there. So wow. and now I've like expanded and added a drop off up north of the city. So I go south, north. Some people pick it up here and I've divided it into picking it up on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And I partnered with a farm called City Bitty Farm. OK. Um, and they are doing produce boxes with their with their lettuces. And then offering my meal kits there, too. Oh, wow. That's really cool. So, so, so you're you're making it work. I'm making it work. And what's, what's kind of crazy is like one of the questions is how has this changed? Will restaurants go back to normal? There's no normal anymore. Yeah. Um, which is unfortunate. <clears throat> the only, the only hope I have is that my restaurant is so small that people might want to come here more 
than a big, huge restaurant where there's, you know, 250 seats in there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mine, mine fits 36 people. Yeah. We, there's a, by me, there's a restaurant. It's one of my the favorite, one of my favorite places to go. And their lease was up in June is, well, is up in June. And they just said, well, we're not going to renew. We're, we're just completely shutting down. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping maybe they'll, when everything starts to calm down, they can open up elsewhere. But, you know, there's no guarantee that they're going to be able to do that. So it's, you know, it's devastating to smaller restaurants. And it's it's a shame because that's where you, to me, you get some of the best food. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky because I made good business decisions where if I had to pay and support the restaurant out of my own pocket, which I have, uh, I, I will yeah. and have and have done. <clears throat> so... Um, but it's also great to see all the people that are supporting, you know, I don't know if you saw my website. So I created, uh, my friend Shane set up the online platform for me and then I populated the entire thing in a matter of days. Okay. Um, I added pictures and I even put in the thing like our team. So there's a picture of Halbert and Kyle and, and Doug and John and says, you know, you can pay $3 and buy them a beer and then you can give them five bucks, give them a tip and you can give them 10 bucks and give them a beer, a tip and a virtual high five. And so oh, people awesome. have just not even ordered food and they've just sprung up that. And so people have been super supportive. That's awesome. And that, that brings me to the next question. I've seen that you guys have done some virtual happy hours and like, they look like cocktail classes. Yeah. So John has done it. Somebody had said she wanted a bartender to help her with some distant drinking with her friends. And then we just decided to expand it and just, we've done it every Friday. This will be our fifth one. Um, and actually I'm, I'm cooking on it oh at five o'clock central time. So, Oh my goodness. <clears throat> so I may have to jump on that one. Yeah. So you can zoom if you want to interact or you can watch on Facebook live. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah. How many people can, can participate in a zoom session? I guess, I don't know. I think right you can have as many as you want on there, but I, when I have it on gallery view, I can only see 16 people at a time. Okay. I'm usually at my house and John has typically like come up with the, the cocktails that he wants to do and all that. And so like the first one, we just showed them how to make a grand fashion. And then the, the host of the party came and bought our grand fashion kit and took it home and made them at home. And so the whole point, and I gave them like for tonight, I gave them all the ingredients for what we're going to cook tonight. And if they want to, have them and then they watch me do it and get the recipes while we're doing it, then they can make it afterwards. That is really cool. <laughs> I love those ideas. Those are fantastic. And now you mentioned that, you know, there's going to be the, what used to be normal is not going to be after this eases up. Can, do you have any inkling of what things are going to be like afterwards, for, you know, for your business in particular or small restaurants in general? I know it's a hard like, question to answer, but yeah, I, I, I can see my restaurant coming back to kind of the same normal yeah. as far as, you know, we're so regular driven that I just don't see them not ever coming back again. I feel yeah. like as soon as they're able to come back and, you know, uh, James sit there and Ben and Sam sit there and, and Matt sit over there and then the non-regulars you know, populate the tables. Yeah. I think that that's totally going to happen again. Good. Um, but I, what's, what's strange to me is after transferring the catering part into these family meal kits, it might turn out oddly that I might add a job here because these people, uh, the people want me to continue on doing these meal kits after they go back to work. Yeah. Uh, cause it's a huge help to them, but my person that's doing it now will be doing corporate catering. So, you know. so, so there's a positive to it and, and all this, there, there's a positive, there's a chance to expand business possibly after this is eased up a bit. It, it is possible. And, you know, I've done so many things like, um, you know, we even sell toilet paper and I packaged up salt and flour and sugar because, you know, it's some people said that it was hard to even find those basic things. I'm like, well, I get to buy 50 pound bags. I can sell you flour. So. Yeah. Oh, that was one of the hardest things to find around here was, was flour and the toilet paper shortage, I don't know what the hell's going on with that. I don't know why everybody's hoarding toilet paper, but there was flour was hard to find. Yeast was impossible to find, things like that. It was, yeah. it was pretty wild there for a while. We're starting to, at least in my area, we're starting to see 
a little bit of, of, of eating up on, on some of the grocery necessities, but there's still like no toilet paper anywhere. What, are, know, these, what are these people so, doing? How much do you need? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> has, has your diet changed that badly? <laughs> The, well, that and like, like the shelves being empty of soap. I'm like, did you guys just never wash your hands before? Yeah, exactly. Like, I didn't have to buy a bunch of soap. I had soap. The I same know. soap I would. I know. <clears throat> so it's kind panic, of interesting. Yeah, panic mode I, sets in, and I don't know what people start thinking, but, but that, so, how can people follow you, you guys? How can they join in on one of these uh, virtual happy hours and cocktail classes? And for local people. Uh, in Kansas City, Missouri area, how can they get one of these meal kits? Uh, so you can go to the website or get on our, our uh, email list, and I send out menus by Monday, and then I get orders by Friday, and then they'll be – it's like a 10-day process. Okay. You'll see it on Monday, and then I will bring them out the following Wednesday. Okay. And they can either pick them up. Because <clears throat> what happened before is we would make a whole bunch of family meal kits for the people that – yeah, I didn't advertise it just for my friends that wanted them. Yeah. And then I would always make like four extra and then I would put them on the website to sell here and they would always sell. And people were like, what about these meal kits? Or they're, they're always sold out. I'm like, you know, maybe I should just pre-order them. So, I, you know, it's been a learning curve, but it's kind of cool. Like learning how to do this online website and putting in boxes where they can ask for a pick up here or pick up there or pick up at the Belfry. And it's like, yeah, yeah. I love learning things. And uh, the learning curve over the past two months or last month has just been really cool for me because yeah. I don't I don't know if I've had a learning curve like this in my career in a long time where it's like, you know, yeah. like I know nothing. I got to learn everything. Yeah. So it's pretty cool in that sense. Well, I've been following you guys <laughs> consistently, keeping up with you and John and uh I'm going to try to jump in on one of these cocktail sessions and, and, uh, so, yeah. So Friday you can follow on the, uh, my Facebook page. I usually repost it. So you get all the information for zoom. If you want to actually be in the zoom meeting and interact, or you can just watch the Facebook live. I start a watch party after she starts recording. Okay. So you can always find it on my page and, uh, Twitter and, and, uh, Instagram are both at Selena Tio and at the Belfry lounge. Ken Curson is a writer and the guitarist and founding member of the band The Lilacs, who just reunited after a 26-year hiatus. He talks about how the virus has affected the reunion plans and if it's affected his writing at all and how he submits his work. I want to know a little bit about how how this whole uh, virus has affected you uh, because you've reunited your band, uh, The Lilacs, and you guys have been playing live shows and, uh, you know, had, had this whole reunion going. And I was just curious to know if this lockdown has affected plans for the band, uh, for the immediate future. Yeah, it absolutely has affected us. And, uh, and, you know, uh, I hate to even be, uh, have there be even a whiff of complaining about how this has affected, you know, my little side project band when there are people who are dying by, you know, in some cases, the thousands yeah. a day and, and, uh, literally billions in the world have had, had their, their lives and routines turned upside down. So, uh, I don't, I don't want to give anyone the impression that I think, you know, the lilacs, uh, missing a few shows is, is some big deal in, in, in the, the, the grand scheme of things. Right. Um, but I will say that, that the absence of live music, uh, generally, has been uh, has been tragic um, as as has the the lack of all um, live cultural experiences. Uh, you know, I have lots of friends in the theater community, and watching them you know work for three four months to get a show up and then cancel it before it even opens um, yeah. is brutal on their livelihoods. It's brutal on their their creative spirit. And as we who appreciate live cultural events know these, these moments will never come back again. They're, they're not like on hold somehow. Um, right, right. You know, the, the great Foo Fighters performance that might've been uh, on April 1st and the, the great theater show that might've been on April 15th. Those, those uh, will just never happen. And, and that's a shame. So uh, for the Lilac specifically, we had, we had a great show booked f- uh, for the international pop overthrow festival in uh, Chicago on um, April 20th. And that, of course, was canceled. Yeah. And then we were going to go to um, Hamburg 
or oh, I didn't say Hamburg, Liverpool. I got Beatles on the <laughs> on the mind, so I'm, I'm thinking of their hot spots. We we had um, three shows booked in Liverpool oh, wow. at the Cavern Club. Oh, um, awesome! And a slightly different configuration of the band, but um, but those were canceled as well. And the the sad thing about it for me, as you know, I'm I'm a 51 year old dude here, is that um, this has been by far the most successful record of my uh, on again, off again, rock and roll career. So oh, wow. it's odd after pursuing rock and roll as a career for, you know, when I was a young man um, and having, you know, a little bit of success in touring the world, uh, I put it on hold as we discussed the last time we talked yeah. for 20 years, then, you know, uh, decided to, to dip my toe back in. And all of a sudden our record was uh, all over Sirius XM. We've been played on commercial stations uh, in Cincinnati and on, in Sacramento and uh, in Chicago, our hometown. Um, and this this record's actually moving some units, as, as they say. You know, <laughs> nobody gets rich in the in the music business anymore, as right. you know. But um, you know, to finally have some interest in our music has been so gratifying, and yet pretty frustrating that we can't really get out there and promote it uh, the way we ought to because of what's happening in the world. Are you able to do anything to promote the album besides encourage people to to listen and, and ask for it in the rotations and, and radio stations? Well, what you just said is exactly what we are doing. You know, uh, for example, just uh, just this week, Spotify gave us the uh, the blue check of dignity. Uh, <laughs> that means we're a, we're a verified artist, um, and uh, that's really important to me because there's another lilacs. Uh, these super handsome young kids from Northern <laughs> England have called themselves the lilacs, and they they. They're, even their logo is like ours used to be. And they, they wear uh, Fred Perry. I'm like sort of famous for being a douchebag and always wearing Fred Perry uh, shirts. And th I look at this, the fake lilacs and they, they do also. So I feel oh. really imitated, uh, but not in a flattering way. They're, they're much they're much handsomer and they're, they're great singers. So I was really glad that Spotify, because I know people like even, you know, people who know me said, yeah, I heard your great new song. And then they'll mention one of their songs. I'm like, God damn it. That's it? not it. So, uh, so this, this helps. Um, so yes, we are doing some things and, you know, um, we've, we've, we've put much more effort and time into our, uh, all the stuff I hate, like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. I hate all of it. Um, but, uh, it's the only way to, to communicate with people right now. We can't, we can't perform for them. Yeah. Unfortunately. So there's, and there's, I, I've seen some bands do zoom sessions or live streams. Is, is that something that you guys have talked about at all uh you know we really haven't um because i think that that's uh, first of all I, almost all of them are terrible i yeah. i saw my first one that i really love today and that was oddly enough the doobie brothers doing black water oh wow um you know i i can't believe there was anything new and interesting to crank out of that uh 40 plus year old song You're right but they did a great job on it um but i think most of the isolations i've seen have been way closer to that just piss poor version of imagine that uh, a bunch of celebrities did oh. instead of really heartfelt. Uh, this has to be done. Yeah. I, I don't like doing anything at the, you know, at this point, music is not my, it's not my source of income. It's not, it's not what I do for a living. So I, I feel like it's, it's sort of uh, unfortunate to do something because we, you know, to keep our names out there. I saw the Rolling Stones one as much, as much as I love that band, I thought it was terrible. Um, yeah. so I, I don't, I don't want to do something unless it's, it can be great. Um, but we have made, uh, so two of my, uh, the guys I jam with, um, one's the former drummer of the lilacs and one is, uh, uh, just a guy I've been playing with since high school. We've made a bunch of videos of us doing cover songs and that's been really fun, but they're real videos where we're playing together in a room and jamming, yeah. um, because we're, we're so connected and we see each other every day that we really don't need to be as socially distant since we're, if one of us is infected, we all are. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of the, the, uh, the way my job actually feels about it. Cause I got to go in every day, but, uh, see, so you, now you, you also do a lot of traveling and writing and has this changed the way you've had to do your day to day job? Yeah, it has. I mean, you, you know, uh, I, I have a barn in far western New Jersey that's, you know, literally my neighbors are horses and goats and uh, alpacas and llamas and stuff. So um, 
I, I'm spending way less time in New York City and way more time in, in our, our kind of crappy, drafty barn. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's, a, that's, again, thank God uh, I have that option. I feel really uh, self-conscious saying how bad this thing sucks because with people really suffering, I really feel, uh, including lots of people I've known who've, who've had uh, you know, near death experiences and, and, uh, a couple whose parents and stuff have died. Nobody, nobody I know closely has died. Um, and then there's another thing I'm really worried about, which I'll, I'll say, which I, I don't, I feel like I don't hear enough artists expressing. And I, it's really discouraging to me how, um, how this thing's broken, like every other damn thing in our country into a right left issue. Yes. And it's portrayed, it's really oversimplified and portrayed as, the left wants to stay on lockdown forever. The right wants to get back to work right now. And, you know, those, that's, those are really oversimplified explanations. But what I do want to say is that I think I think the country has, in general, not correctly understood the the devastating effects of poverty. I'm not talking about the, uh, just on our wealth and on our economy, which is pretty obvious. I'm talking about the health effects of poverty. I'm very concerned that we don't understand that. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that about 14 million people a year die from poverty-related diseases. Mm. Um, and the and Oxfam estimates that just the lockdown, if it were to end almost immediately, has already put 6 to 8% more of the world's population in poverty. Oh, wow. So if you do the math there, you're looking at just the economic shutdown should cost about 1 million to 2 million additional lives from poverty. So oh that's gosh. that's going to be way more than than the worst case uh, models of COVID nineteen, and I don't I don't really think you can put a value on you know one life versus another. But if you look at the sort of the average age and the comorbidities of people dying of COVID nineteen versus the young people who are dying in uh, in the world of poverty, I really think we've underestimated the the devastating health effects of poverty. Um, so that, that's what I'll say there. I'm not, I'm no, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm not even smart, so I don't really have much of anything to say, but I do think it, it's, it, it doesn't make you a cold, heartless right wing lunatic to say, yeah, I'm really worried about what's going to happen when 30 million people lose their jobs. Yeah, so. well, exactly. And I've, I've had restaurateurs and, and, you know, people other than musicians on this small episode that I'm doing and, yeah, you, you know, they've said similar things. It, it's just, it can be, it's going to be devastating. In fact, locally, it, you know, a couple of my favorite places to go have decided not to reopen. And I mean, yeah. it doesn't put tons of people out of work, but it's, it, you know, it's, 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 it's a loss of a job for, for a handful of people per establishment. But, it, you know, it, it also, uh, it's it's discouraging because now that I've got these places that I like to go, and I've, there's, there's going to be fewer of them, and it's going to be when when things do ease up, it's going to be more the the big box stuff that's that's still open and not the the smaller establishments that I prefer. Yeah, no, I think that's terrible too. You know, a, a cornerstone of of capitalism, and and this should be a point the the left is making more a cornerstone of capitalism of you know the free market is that the government does not pick winners. So this this notion that the government sort of shut down every small mom and pop operation and allowed Walmart and Home Depot to operate is just total madness. Yeah, and uh, you know their their theory was well well people have to eat and they sell food at Walmart, but they also sell things like. Uh, eyeglasses and, and you see people in there touching them and trying them on, you know, on this disease that clearly ha- enters the body through the eyes. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's ludicrous, um, how these decisions have been made. And, uh, and then the whole concept of an essential worker, I think is, is really a, a, a sort of demeaning phrase. It, I mean, yeah, it really you is. know, to the, to the guy who's, a uh, bookstore has been put out of business and now he can't feed his family. Well, you can bet his kids thought that job was pretty damn essential. Yeah. So I, I, I just, I do not, I do not, I find the way that we're supposed to feel guilty or, um, or, uh, greedy. If we are worried about the economic effects of this, I find that really, uh, censorious and, um, quite frankly, obnoxious that, that on, you know, on everyone's social media feeds, 
if you if you post something like let's get back to work it's like yeah let's all die who cares about the, the people who are dying it's like yeah. no i care a lot about people dying that's one of the reasons i want to get back to work exactly exactly so so personally your family you guys have been holding up okay you know thank god we we really have my my family is uh you know um young and healthy and i i, I think i mentioned i have five teenagers um, the, the threat of this de- disease to, to young people has in general been virtually nil, uh, right. almost zero. There are, there are a few uh, odd cases of Kawasaki disease in the New York area, but it's not even clear that they're related to COVID. And, and there's they're so few um, that, although they're scary, and I, again, I feel bad for the people. Look at the tyranny. You have to say it all times. And I feel for these people. Yeah. Or otherwise, you know, you're an asshole. Exactly. So yeah, I, I, know. Just, I, I feel so tyrannized by, by the, the language that I, I end up policing myself. Um, but you know, look, thank God my, my, my kids, uh, are healthy. They're all becoming like dumber by the second. Like I, I watch them do these, uh, zoom classes and these teachers, every teacher in America deserves like a gigantic raise because yeah. I, I've seen how incredibly hard it is, uh, to teach kids anything. And, um, you know, my, my wife is a, a education administrator. My ex-wife is a teacher. So I always had this intimate sense that they do important, good work. Right. But man, you really just see how tough it is to, to keep young people focused on anything. So uh, that's, that's one of the weird upsides that's going to come out of this is a real realignment of what we think is important. I hope you know, so. like the idea that everyone has to gather together in offices, is like, yeah, maybe not. You know, I'll be honest with you. That's one of the uh, the upsides of this has been that me, as unfortunate as it is that I have got to go into work every single day, the traffic has been almost non-existent. So I kind of like that. But on the, the downside, my kids haven't had school since April. They kind of they just shut it down. They uh, here locally where I'm at, they they can't guarantee that the, all the kids have High, high enough speed internet to complete the work and, and submit right. what they have. So they, instead of, you know, excluding some, they just shut it down for everyone. For everyone, yeah. They have like no, it's literally work. the lowest common denominator. It's like yeah. who's got the worst computer access? Let's do it at that speed. Exactly. And that's that's a, a really thorny philosophical question that schools face all the time. Like, that's the idea of should there be gifted programs where everyone else gets left behind, or do you just put everyone in the classroom and teach to the the, the, the slowest kid. Yeah. And I, I, this is one of those issues where I'm not even sure what I think on this, because I do think even the smartest kids, you know, really benefit. I, th- I think that that's what life is. It's like, there's all kinds of people that they, they go at different paces and you got to learn to, to adjust. So yeah. I'm, I, I don't even have a strong philosophy on, on this question, but you're really right that if, you know, if three kids out of 200, don't have the high speed internet, you know, then nobody uses it. Um, yeah. Everything's actually voluntary. They're, they are posting things for the kids to do, but none of it's graded. It's right. very, very strange. Yeah. And in a weird way that actually makes the inequality even greater, right? Because the self-motivated kids whose parents are helicoptering over them and, you know, uh, demanding that they do well, they do even more of the work. And now the kids whose parents are maybe distracted by having to pay the bills or single parent households or whatever, um, they're not, they're falling even further behind. So yeah. these weird, uh, like, like all um, efforts to, there, there's always unintended consequences and they're, they're always uh, unfortunate. So this, the, the inequality is getting greater. I literally see that in my own family oh, where wow. the smarter ones of my kids they don't need, they don't need to be taught, told to do their homework at all. They just sit there, they're bored. So they do homework and yeah. where my other kids, they're bored. So they play ping pong or they're, they're bored. So they, they, you know, yep. they, they do something else that's not related to school. And it's really true, um, that, that this kind of thing is going to enhance all the inequality, uh, that there is. Yeah. You know, I think that's, that's a, a very good point. I, I didn't even really think about it until speaking with you just now. So, and it, it's, I'm kind of dealing with, with the same thing. My uh, oldest two, I we, we've got to kind of push them to do their work. My son, most of all, he he gets distracted with with playing elect- with his electronic stuff, and I don't mean like games. I mean like taking TVs and stuff apart and, and radio. <laughs> That's the, the electronics he's being distracted that. by. Uh, but my youngest daughter is just in and doing her work immediately, getting it done. And uh, my oldest is somewhere in between because. Her, her 
class is different. She's actually in the nursing program at her high school, so she she can't do a lot of that. And a lot of her curricula was based around that, so there's nothing she can do. So she's not getting a whole lot of work to do. So, yeah. So, well, can I, like I said, I promise you this would be a real quick episode. It's because it's, it's going to be part of a greater one that I'm actually stitching together. Um, but what, have the Lilacs been doing anything uh, to prepare for after every, the lockdown quarantine era lifts? Um, we, we don't have anything specific planned, but it's pretty clear. We really enjoy playing together. Um, thankfully, like I said, there's, there's more people than there used to be who, who are interested in our music. And, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's pretty clear. You haven't heard the last of the lilacs. I don't, I don't know whether that means there's a, you know, some world tour in the offing, but I know, uh, David has been writing songs. I've been writing songs. We had loose plans for this summer to get together for a couple weeks of like sort of songwriting workshopping, uh, which really would be a treat. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's still going to be possible given the situation. Um, you know, I, I'm willing to, uh, but I don't, you know, who knows what, what travel and stuff. He lives in Utah. I live in New York city. So, uh, I just don't know if it's, if it's going to happen. Um, but, uh, I, I think by the time things normalize and, and people are like not afraid to go out, you're, you're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of lilacs uh, shows and maybe some, some new recordings as well. That would be amazing. And I'm hoping you guys get down to the DC area to play. Cause I'm, Dying to see you guys live and meet up with you in person. Yeah, that'd be so nice, Mark. That would be fantastic. I'll bring my camera, take some shots of the show. Yeah, I thought you were going to send us some pictures to put on Rock and Roll Globe at some point. But, you know, we have all these great photographers who have, like, understood that our site is interested in photography. And we have these really, this guy, Raphael from uh, England, guy literally goes out every night and now he must be dying with all the shutdowns. And he sends these great photos to use. Um, this other guy, Ed Lines in Chicago. We, we're having these really great photographers who are, oh, who are sort of into our site. So check it out. Alan Epley plays in so many bands I can't even count them. But he also plays as part of the musical ensemble for the Blue Man Group and tends bar when he has any free time. He talks about how COVID-19 has affected every aspect of his life. And it's it's such a weird time, so and that's that's one reason why I wanted to have you on because you, you know you you get hit in, in more than one way. I mean, you know you you work with Blue Man Group, and you know you you work in the restaurant industry at Longman and Eagle, yeah. And that's so so a lot of what you you usually rely on for income is gone right now. Yeah, yeah. It's almost it's completely dried up. I was able to apply successfully for unemployment. And so that's been nice um, yeah. as it has provided some um, just a little safety net as it's supposed to yeah. give them a little breathing room. And um, so that will continue for a while. We also have some savings and some, some money put away. So, um, but yeah, it definitely is a reckoning, you know, it, this is one of those, um, I, I don't know if you, if you, <clears throat> if it would have altered my, career path had I known that this was coming on, had I known hypothetically in some magical way, right. I'm not sure it would have, you know, it just is what it is. Um, and there's many people that are not just musicians and in, in the service industry that are not able to get back to work also, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, for, for years, I, for like a good decade or more, I was in outside sales and you know, that's dead right now. Just, you can't go anywhere. I'm sure. So, yeah, I've got friends doing that still, and it's you know they're they're in in a, you know the same boat as as you and and so many other people that they've just been kind of laid off and they have to rely yeah. on 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 some help right now. But now with uh with stuff stuff like Blue Man Group, that'll eventually come back. I mean, mm-hmm. have they given you any in you know uh, have they given you any assurances about anything like that? Like oh, we just once this comes back, you know we'll we'll hit the road running or. I assume that restaurants and these kind of size venues will be some of the last to return. Um, so I, I'm in for the, a long, tough haul on this, you know, but um, they are always keeping us up to date. And we have a, we have a circulating 
kind of newsletter and updates from our general manager. Um, and she works for Cirque du Soleil. Cirque owns Blue Man at this point, which is good. Um, yeah. They have kind of controlling properties on that uh, ownership. But um, so I foresee us being able to sustain through the downtime, although I have no timetable on when that would return. I really don't know. I, I, it has to hinge on a vaccine or, you know, some other kind of like uh, sea change as far as that kind of shit goes. So I don't, I don't really know, man. I, I'm just kind of up in the air and, um, <clears throat> you know, seeing what my options are as far as um, teaching, you know, and yeah. teach, expanding teaching online, doing that. I've always done that historically um, before I moved to Chicago. So okay, I'd love to get back into that too. So, so, and you had things coming up in the future, like uh, the new first new Shiner album in 20 years. And you, you guys are going to be touring to support that. Is, yeah. is the album still going to be coming out? And uh, are you doing other things to promote the album without a tour? The album is still coming out. We, uh, we have gone to great lengths to uh, secure really good PR. We're releasing it ourselves, but we, um, we hired a great PR company, Grandstand and Lisa Gottsow there. So it's on a very pretty strict release schedule. Um, so yes, it is coming out May 8th. We were going on tour May 21st and then into July and August, but, um, that's not happening, yeah. but I, I don't know. I, you know, I, you know, some States are starting to open, but you can't go on tour if nobody's going to really go. And like, I don't know. I, I I'm hesitant until there's, I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that our fans will wait until 2021. Oh, yeah. And so I can bide my time and make, another record or, you know, as it would be great if I could get together with um, those guys and rehearse, you know, with yeah. the Shiner guys and do that, that would be great. Or if I could get together with the life and times guys and rehearse, or even with, you know, Ian and do that just even in small groups would be really cool. Um, so I'm looking forward to that next phase. Yeah. I, I, you know, just, I realize that everything will be eased back in, but I'm just looking forward to that next phase when we get to get, start crushing beers and at least rocking in the studio together. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And like you're saying, you know, you, some States are opening up and, but you, you know, it's hard to plan a tour when you, you can go to Florida, but you can't go to any state in between Chicago and Florida or something, you know? Yeah, so. exactly. So you just make it a tour of Florida. Yeah. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> the panhandle tour. Yeah. And play to like, you know, how would they, how do you open a venue? You know, you, you could do reduced capacity and, Everybody has to stand in a square or something after yeah. people talk about that, you know, making a grid on the floor and you only oh. get your, you know, and like that kind of shows like, but doesn't it take all the fun out of it? You know? And like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to go. I don't know if it's, I don't know. It just feels weird to me. Yeah. It, 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 it it's one of those things you gotta, you just, I think you gotta have to wait it out a bit because I so too. Like you said, it's not it's it's no fun if you have to go to to go into the point to go into a show is not to have somebody mark out where you can stand. Right. And exactly. You know, that's and, the kind of the ruins the vibe. It's like yeah. having sex through a sheet. Yeah. Also. And I can tell you from experience that that's no fun. I'm kidding. So now you also have uh, Bird Hands. Is uh, is that going to be coming out as well? Have is that finished? Yeah. It's finished. We just don't have any timetable for it. We okay. just, we're shooting for it's a much loosey, loosey gooseyer thing. Um, it's definitely our side project, um, yeah. but we're super pumped about it. And super proud of it. It turned out so good, and we're willing to tour on it ad nauseum when it comes out. You know, we're like, but um, it also depends on where my life is at because our our lives have been kind of scheduled around. Um, these jobs, which are, <clears throat> I can put in my blue man schedule, you know, a week, a month, a month ahead of time and yeah. tell them when I'm going to be out and in, and they can put shows around that. And then the same with, you know, my bartending schedule. So it's like, I've, I've got these jobs that are, you know, a you know, they're, they're, uh, they're part-time gigs. So it makes it easier to leave town. And so, but, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I don't, we'll have to see what my next, you know, occupation is. So. Right. <laughs> Have you have you uh, started any new projects while you've been kind of on lockdown? I just am trying to finish up my own kind of. 
I hate to even say solo record, but I guess it kind of is. It's stuff that's, it's a lot more, uh, I'm, I'm working on that a lot. So, um, I like it. Yeah, it's really good. It's, uh, probably not too far from a kind of, uh, kind of a Beck sea change vibe and that, oh. that kind of like era kind of like not too far, a little bit of uh bony bear and, uh, that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a little different, but that is awesome. That's like, that's like my favorite Beck album. So. Oh yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's a, that was a big one. He's, he's sad. Yeah, so, it's funny. I got, little, I remember, I got a little feel for that now too, so I can. Oh, good, man. That's awesome. I remember hearing that when it, uh, it just came out. My wife and I went to a record store. We heard it. I'm like, this is really good. Who is this? And I go up yeah. to the counter and they're like, oh, it's Beck. It's loser, Beck. loser, Beck. Uh yeah, uh huh. And I'm right. Like, yeah. And yeah, and uh-huh. even before then, you know, was uh, Midnight Vultures tour yeah. and all stuff, which was super happening i was a big fan i saw him open for i saw dirty three open for beck at uh, memorial hall in kansas city and it was awesome dirty threes it was a really interesting kind of bill because it was like super non sequitur you know yeah what a and dirty three they're kind of a broke down three piece i I don't know if you know them but yeah they're great familiar, but i'll I'll definitely check them out they on band camp because i'll go and check them out uh i don't know they're they're old dudes i don't know they were this was back in the day oh uh, okay so, uh, oh yeah yeah you said it was a friend on a back tour uh-huh organ gear is drunk in prayer he's on the road a lot and was in the middle of writing some new material and recording it when everything went on lockdown for the covid19 virus he talks about how it's affected his writing about releasing music during the pandemic and live streaming I, I, I was lucky, like a few other people, that I already had some stuff like like this crazy alone. I wasn't expecting it to be a um, a single. It was in demo form. That's the demo, pretty much. Okay. Of a of a different version that like, has has better sound quality and whatnot. But I was lucky to already have it. It's interesting to see people that are releasing stuff now because that says they they had it pretty much uh, in the can as this was was hitting. So like, there's gonna be there's going to be a huge drop off of original content <laughs> with, pretty pretty soon. But and then and then when when we get back to work, there's gonna there's gonna be a, a few months and then just an avalanche of material oh of people God. writing now and and finishing stuff up now. Yeah, yeah, but not too many people. Uh, the work was so appropriate for what's going on right now. It sounds yeah. Well, that crazy alone worked out well. I mean, yeah. I didn't I hadn't. I didn't really think about it because it wasn't written about this, but it was applicable. It was all Chris that kind of had the, the epiphanies is like, you should just put out because it was, it's an interesting version. It's not the one, like I said, given my choice, I wouldn't release that one as the single, but it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a bad take of it. And it, and it works for these times. And it was her idea to do that, that video based on, um, this guy, Jamie Harmon out of Memphis, mm-hmm. at the quarantine project, um, does similar things, but yeah, I, it seriously, it's it's super catchy. I mean, it's running through my head for days. So it's still, yeah. I'll be in the kitchen. I'll be in, <laughs> like, oh, like, oh, that's Morgan's song. Oh, that's cool. All right. It works. It's catchy. It works. You know, the one thing, that, like, like I got, it's like the, the vocals are a little bit kind of dead sounding to me and undy- undynamic. I got a tiny bit flat. Because it was a demo, I, you know, I'm not entertaining myself with it. Um, yeah. yeah. But and, and I talked to uh, a couple of people, and they said, you know, it actually kind of works conceptually for for the song, in, in that you know, a lot a lot of people are just sitting around. It doesn't work for a great pop song because the you know it doesn't have the best mix or the best vocal take or something. But it does sound like somebody sitting who's been sitting in their bed for four or five days straight. Yes. The atmospherically, <laughs> lyrically, everything. It, it, it's perfect for right now. It, wor- it works for that. So. <laughs> so, all right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how this whole pandemic is affecting people who are creative and usually out in public in a creative fashion. You know, you play out you tour you you know a lot of your your time is spent in front of an audience um 
so I'm, I imagine that's also a fairly good source uh, of your income. So what what do you do to at, in a time like this to supplement the lack of touring and playing live? Well, I mean, it's kind of um, to supplement the income. I've, I've made way more doing these live streams than I do in my actual live shows. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Um, I just don't want to do, do them. The problem is you can't go from city to city with, you have the same crowd every time. So yeah. I, yeah. I did a few of them in a row just to kind of get my sea legs on. How is this going to work at all? Um, and now I'm going to scale it back to doing no more than one every couple of weeks, just to keep it fresh and do try to do something different. I just don't want to, I want to do something different every time too. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And as far as like, I, I don't make that much money playing live anyway. There's, there's a few places where I do like, like in Portland, I do okay. And every once in a while in Asheville. So I didn't really take a big hit by not being able to tour. In fact, it kind of leveled the playing field a little bit because of the people who do tour a lot aren't able, they're in my shoes now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, now nobody's making any money doing it. So it works out for me in that I would rather be doing, I would probably rather do a, um, a studio performance than a live performance anyway, nine times out of 10. I mean, I wouldn't ever want to stop playing live, but um, I would much rather have a controlled environment and not have to worry about the whims or whatever Yahoo stumbles into the sleazy bar. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Like, you know, me in, in Maryland. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm not saying I despise my audience. It's just that. Uh... Just don't really like them all that much. No, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. like, there's a certain amount of stage fright. I, um, I, I like control, all, all that kind of thing. There's, there's, if I mean, like, playing big shows, I love it. I just don't play that many big shows. So, like, yeah, um, yeah. I like playing with Freakwater and the Handsome Family because they played to two, three thousand people. Yeah, and you can. Is exciting playing, playing by myself at a brewery to people who are barely paying attention. It's like I don't really miss that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because <laughs> you know, when you're playing in a, in a in that situation, people, some people, like when I met you over at Mums, you know, people were already there. You know, you can't. Mums was nice. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and they paid attention and they, they liked music every once in a while, but that was a more of an exception to the rule when you're playing in a place where people don't know who you are, didn't ask for you to be there. Yeah. I was just on, on tour and found a place to play. And that was one to where I was lucky enough to where they, they like music. They seem to have a, a, a fairly, a, a fairly uh, good taste in music and sophisticated taste, you know? Yeah. So, so, so anybody who came in there with decent songs, I feel like would, would do okay. Cause they're, they, they like it, but that's more of the exception to the rule. Most people want to watch TV. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so you've re you have released a new song and video that was, and, and, and we were talking just before I started recording this, it wasn't necessarily inspired by the lockdown, but it is absolutely appropriate for this lockdown. Uh, it, crazy it, alone. It, yeah, it, it worked. It worked out really well. Um, yeah, I was so I was already in the headspace of all these songs I have because I was in the middle of working on an album. That was just that was one of them that. Um, I can't even remember if the original words were even. I'm going crazy alone. Um, it just kind of morphed into that with, um, it, I mean, the, this situation is applicable to, to lots of other situations where you could use the same words to describe how you're, how you're feeling. And that one, that one started off as being written basically after doing a tour that was 90% of those playing at a brewery solo to people who were halfway paying attention. Um, and, and having put out Cordelia and not, and I didn't feel like it got the, a, a lot of the um, attention that it, it should have gotten because I think it's a really great album. So I was just, just feeling, feeling a little um, kind of um, creatively alone. And Asheville was a lonely place. You know, it's like yeah. coming from coming from Portland, we've got tons of musician friends there and lots of people doing stuff. To where here, it's it's where musicians come after they've already done stuff. You know, like there's there's people who go to Nashville to record but live here because it's pretty. They don't necessarily, it's not, there's not a whole lot going. There's a lot of music, but it, there's somehow not a lot going on. Oh, wow. So with this lockdown, have there been any positives to it? Are you working on any new, new material like a, a 
COVID nineteen based album? Um, the next the next album I was already working on is going to be colored by by all of this. Um, I was just going to go in today or tomorrow and start looking at some of the lyrics to see if they still kind of like feel right personally after after all this. So there'll be some kind of adjustments, kind of like the Crazy Alone song. Like there's going to be some adjustments to be like, okay, with this headspace, I mean, I might end up with another, uh, with like hold off on some of the songs till after this blows over that are, that are a little more um, extroverted and kind of a little more mindless, just kind of rock songs okay. and keep some of the ones that are more relevant to right now for this next record. I think it's going to change a lot. Um, maybe not stylistically, but it is probably going to be a lot heavier than the rest of the stuff I've done. Oh. It, was headed, it was headed in that direction anyway. And there's, I don't know. I, I imagine a lot of people are in the same headspace to where it just seems like there's the slate's been wiped clean a little bit to where you can kind of like start over where when people come out of this, I mean, they're going to, people are going to look different when they come out of this, they're going to act different. And, and, and for me, it does seem like a, a, a reset button has, has been pushed to where it's like, you know what, this, this is where I'm at. It's, it, it's heavy and loud yeah, and, and atmospheric and, and a lot less kind of like, a lot less of the like the Jason Isbell, John Prime side of things. Okay, okay. So, where the hell was I going with this? Oh, so, okay. So you've done. Uh, <laughs> I can edit some of this stuff out. So you you were one of the first people that I noticed to start doing live streams. Uh, how's that experience been? And uh, you know, is there is there a, a positive or negative to doing a live stream as opposed to to being out and and touring you know even smaller places yeah i mean um that same like having control over what's played i can like i said it, one of the drawbacks is that you've got the same crowd every time yeah as, a, as opposed to well, now i'm in austin now i'm in cleveland um but with that like i can make it more thematic to where like one night was just all country covers um and right. The first couple were more like regular sets, and that was mainly just getting is like what device works best. Um, just how do I share it in the first place? How do I make it look good? What kind of effects I want to use? To where now I've I've got a better idea of the, I've got let's see three more three more shows planned, and each one is a completely different kind of theme. One's that a, a friend of mine has has been doing these camper shows where he's got an old camper that you'll either sit inside or outside of and it's, they record it and we'll be able to like share it later. Oh, cool. And the other one was, I've got, um, what are called, uh, TV mixes of a couple albums, which is basically the music without the lead vocals oh, in case you, in case I could ever license it and they don't want any lead vocals. They just want the, so I was going to do kind of a, a couple of karaoke style shows where I just sing the entire mission field record with the music playing through my stereo. And I'm just going to carry a you know, smile. You're wearing the mission field. Oh, that's I awesome. A lot of fun for me. I wouldn't be playing anything because it's already been recorded that you'd have to dress up for that part. Though. Oh, totally. Yeah. It's going to, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have like lights and, and the, the black suit and everything. Oh, I was going to say, do you have a nudie suit you could, uh, you could throw on? I, you know, I've got two different suits. Maybe I'll do one for one and one for the other. <laughs> and, and, and my little, my little um, studio back there with a little 12 by 12 shed really uh, looks good because it's such a tight little space. You know, it almost looks like a diorama. I did, I did the country show in there and it looks like a diorama because it's, there's, there's stuff everywhere, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's only 12 by 12. So it, it, it looks bigger than it actually is. And it doesn't look very big. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that, um, Tom Waits video for, I don't want to grow up. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, I don't he's know in a that. diorama underneath the, uh, a table in a restaurant. Okay. He's like underneath the table and he's like, I don't want to grow up. <laughs> like playing a tiny little guitar. I think I have <laughs> seen that one ages it's ago. It's an amazing video. Yeah, it's it's incredible. It's That's one of the best videos I've ever seen. So once you, once all this starts, starts to die down and you can actually get out on the road again a little bit, are you, is, are you going to be doing anything differently or is it just going to kind of pick up where you left off? I don't, I don't see any way of picking up where I left off. Um, like I said, it feels like the, um, 
the, the, there's a clean slate and kind of like a, a reset button has been hit. Um, I don't know how it's going to be different, but um, I think it, it will. Like I said, the music's going to change a, a little bit. Like for this next record, I, I feel like going a lot heavier um, just because it just, it just feels like that kind of situation. Um, and the songs kind of fit with it. You can imagine Crazy Alone as, as closer to like a, um, I don't know if you know who Mark Rebo is, but uh, like a late, late era Tom Waits. Okay. I mean by heavy, like that kind of rah, 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 rah. not necessarily like straight up yeah. like Melvin yeah. or something, but So you know you're not gonna be doing like an Orville Peck thing where you just could play with a face mask all over Oh, like Bob Log or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, some, there's this dude on sub pop named Orville Peck and he's got this mask. Yeah, he's got this weird mask of this it, it almost looks like a drape hanging down over his face. <laughs> It's, no, but, but I don't, I don't, you know, may, maybe I could, I could, I could see going that, I mean, like it's, it's kind of refreshing and and exciting to think, think of that clean slate starting, you know, I, I wouldn't probably won't go as far as to like not use the name drunken prayer anymore, but I'm not, I'm not worried about uh, continuity of coming from just like, like, Oh, what makes sense after Cordelia? What kind of record do you make? Like, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. so it's been a little, li- little liberating then. Yeah. Well, it's the same liberation as not having uh, a legit record label it's like, well, or, or anyone asking me to do this at all. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have any, um, um, I'm, I'm not a good salesman for myself, I guess, but I know that, uh, or, or having, having any, um, deadline for anything this is like well just do do it whatever you want and then people can either like it or not like it and it doesn't matter because i've got no label to lose and i've and no one's no one will have done anything for the past year but when we all come out of this you know to where it's just do i'll I'll do whatever i want to do i'll probably if i had to guess i would take some kind of a band on uh local trips like up, like up through Maryland to New York, and maybe down to New Orleans and back, and and Mem- Memphis. That that general, yeah, yeah. Uh, deep South, Mid Atlantic, um, close to New England kind of style, and then do the and really, really my you know my formula still works no matter what as far as finding musicians across the country. Um, it's just that the it'll be different music this time, but but the same probably the same group of players for that matter because luckily the people I play with have a pretty wide palette and can play different stuff and 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 re- even you know it's it's kind of a, a blessing in disguise having this happen in that whatever rut I didn't know I was in or did know um, be easier to hop out of yeah oh well, whether even if even if it's a good some ruts are good some people just put the same album out over and over. And each one is just like, keep doing that. You're doing great. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, you don't need to branch out. Yeah. It's Rolling like, Stones every, made a career out of that. Everyone's good. It's, it's unsurprising and that's fine. Yeah. You know, but, um, but, uh, I'm not, I'm not feeling that this time. I, I think it'll be, I don't know. I, you know, that I, I say that as, as it's something to look forward to. I, I honestly, and I've talked to a few music, musicians that, that Mike Watt, thing he was he agreed with me i was talking to janet from uh Freakwater, how uh it's it's been really hard to get motivated to work on like projects that are currently in motion like you would think that'd be easy it's it's you know you're on you're you're facing downhill you should be able to just like jump into it and, and work like janet was supposed to collaborate and, and go to spain next year and record an album she's like i haven't written one song wow and we were talking about it and she and she uh and she described it as like the the time between caterpillar and butterfly where it's like man there's nothing to do don't don't worry you know it's like you'll be beyond inspired and soon enough so just as there's a time to to um reap and a time to sow and then there's the there's the in between where you're just watching the grass grow so you're in chrysalis form right now yeah, I'm trying to think if I can make a rhyme out of that. There's a time to reap, a time to sow, a time to sit back and watch it grow. <laughs> hey, look at that. You just you hey, did it. We wrote a song. I did it. <laughs> Good for you. You're going to make it. 
<laughs> Roll Tide. Roll Tide. <laughs> Morgan, man, thank you so much. Now, you've got the the song out, Crazy Alone. How can how can that be found? How can people find that and and, and uh, buy it from you? It's almost everywhere. I don't have – it's digital only. Um, so it's in all those places. Uh, probably the – the most direct for me would be Bandcamp, um, cool. and in fact, they're doing another thing where they're not taking any fees on May first. Oh, so I'm probably going to have some kind of push to get people to to go to the Bandcamp on on that day. Um, Bandcamp's kind of cool. Not, not only do I get like a couple more cents, but like the the video is uploaded there and all the lyrics and just notes and stuff. So Bandcamp's kind of a cool site like that. I also have it on my website, but, but as far as buying it, Bandcamp's probably best. But it's also on iTunes, and um, you can stream it on Spotify right now, and um, where else? Google Play, you know, Ton Deezer, stuff like that. All right, cool, man. I'm not too worried about it. You know, I, I, I didn't put this out as, as like, this is a, a time to try to, like, make make some money and if you buy i mean i, I get like a dollar a dollar <laughs> if, if it downloads it which you know it's it beats a, a poke in the eye but i'm not I'm not really doing it to although that said you people can put in whatever they want to somebody That's... last night i just somebody gave 50 dollars wow <laughs> shit yeah i should so, start putting some shit on band camp damn hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i uh, me learning how to play guitar then See, you got all the time in the world. That's true. That's true. Clearly, clearly people don't give a shit about what they buy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got some listeners for this podcast. So. <laughs> no accounting for taste. Exactly. <laughs> Run it up the flagpole and see if it flies. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? They're already not paying for this podcast, so. Why not not Why not pay for something else? <laughs> <laughs> no uh, harm no foul. Exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you so much, man. I appreciate you doing this and and sure. let me know a little bit about what's going on and and uh, how this whole thing's been affecting you. Anytime, man. It's always great talking with you. I want to thank everyone who was able to help out with this show one more time. I know it's not always easy to find the time to talk, even in quarantine. So show your support by the books, magazines, and music. Order takeout. Watch the live streams and tip. Help support the people who are a part of the memories you cherish. These artists create the soundtracks to our lives, the food and atmosphere you crave, and write the words of wisdom and love that you remember when you can't think of your own. Stay safe, everybody.